reach out personally, establish human connections, be a person who likes to hang out, be a presence in the room. Of course, on the other hand, hone your craft, practicing your instruments, almost like journal entries. You kind of have to commit to it to, to get something out of it. Create a routine for yourself. Ask yourself, what can I do to make this better tomorrow? How can I make this sustainable for this year and next year and the one after? This is all sort of advice to myself, by the way. From If Company in the Pacific Northwest, this is the Cinetherapy Podcast, where we do a deep dive into how filmmakers think. I'm Sam McGee, hosting with Mitch Williams. We invite friends and guests from every aspect of the filmmaking process, from big names and big markets to modest markets and small towns. Today, our guest is musical composer Lane King from Spokane, Washington. We talk about moving from Artlist and Film Pack to an exclusive view with music bed collaborating on a recent project and much more enjoy so sam we're back and today we have a guest do you want to introduce the guest i'm nervous to introduce a guest because i don't introduce guests but i'm asking you because you're the original connection to this guest that's true okay so we have lane king um you are a i'm gonna i'm gonna say what i know you are but i'll let you introduce yourself you're a composer a music composer for film and you're here in our hometown Spokane and you found me for photographs because you're going to be on music bed now so we took artist photos and album art photos yes sir and then we spent a lot of time talking about music and film and totally then we said let's let's do this with microphones in front of our faces yeah. And thanks for having me. I'm stoked to be here. I was stoked to see uh, when you when you reached out and said, hey, we have a podcast because I wasn't even aware. So this is great. And yes, I'm a composer. I love music. Always have. And now I've kind of taken it to a vocational spot where I'm writing music for picture primarily and uh, loving it. It's been kind of the dream for, I would say, since college or so, which is now I think I tracked it back on a timeline. It's about six years that I've known about this emerging industry of music for media, you know, but I've always loved film music. So it ties, you know, hand in hand. Um, but yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of like what I would call music for media that I was aware of as a kid. I was more aware of like music in films and how it was affected by the films and the music in them. So yeah, now the fact that I'm able to actually do that is awesome. Um, in this new music for media industry, which I learned about, yeah, six years ago in college. And um, it's kind of just been one long learning experience, if that makes sense. So haven't exactly cracked the code yet or figured anything out. But yeah, I'm stoked that um, that music bed, you know, was open to having me on as a new artist. So that was honestly, that's kind of a what I would say, like a long time dream um, that I was very you know, overjoyed when that actually happened. And now it's the thing. So Mm -hmm. we're getting it rolling. And I hit up Sam because I saw his work with some mutual friends here in Spokane and really dug it because it, to me, it had this dark moody effect, you know, in all your advertisements, interviews, stuff that you post on Instagram. I was like, that's the music bed vibe. (laughs) Dark and moody. And yeah, I think I also noticed you using some music bed tracks. So I was like, okay, that guy knows music bed. So I should hit him up. (laughs) <laughs> that's good. Yeah. It's good. It's that's good or or just commentary on how we all we all gravitate towards the same stuff on music bed and now we notice it. Totally. <laughs> Time to watch an ad on YouTube. Absolutely. Yeah. So I was stoked that you were available. Right on. Love the photos, man. So yeah. we're getting this thing rolling together. I'm excited. It I you reached out and sent me some tracks and I listened to them reluctantly because i don't expect like i know everything that's all like if it's good and it's in spokane i already know it exists yeah so (laughs) i didn't know who you were totally it's probably not that good (laughs) and then i i i do listen to a lot of of um composition for film and tv on a regular basis so i I started listening to these tracks on Google Drive and I forgot that I forgot that I wasn't listening to like somebody on Spotify and I had to go back and pick up my phone and remember that I just clicked on some random email from a guy in this town. Totally. So I <laughs> immediately enjoyed the quality and 
I was drawn to the pedal steel because that's something that it's an intro, it's an instrument that I think country music in the inland Northwest is pretty, it's pretty sparse. We happen to do music videos yeah. for someone who's pushing that boundary. And, um, mm. I, I loved that the pedal steel slipped in there and, made this atmosphere that made me feel like I was listening to, like I was, it was, I was experiencing a movie here. Yeah. Yeah. And pedal so. steel is an interesting one. Cause like, usually we think about country music, you know? Um, and I think back to my first musical experience listening to my dad's iPod, which had Alan Jackson on it. Um, mm-hmm. and some of the other country classics, but Alan Jackson's the one that stood out most to me. Um, and this is a little symbolic moment. I was, I was listening to back, Back to Alan Jackson. I can't remember which song it was. I think it's the one about um, like fathers and children. I don't know which one that is. But it totally has pedal steel all over it. Um, but I didn't know it at the time. When I looked back, I was like, or listened back, I was like, oh, that's pedal steel over the whole mm. thing. Um, and this is a theme I've noticed. So throughout childhood, early adulthood, I've had my favorite bands, favorite artists, albums. Um, and this is how I got into the pedal steel. But like, was listening back. I keep saying listening back, but really, this is this. I'm describing this whole experience of music that I've loved from you know the beginning until now in my life. Um, basically, realized that all of it had pedal steel in it, and I didn't really realize it at the time I was listening to it. But only you know looking back, I'm like, oh, it's pedal steel here, pedal steel there. I'm talking about Bon Iver, Phoebe Bridgers, of course, Alan Jackson, the old traditional country stuff. Um, basically found out, oh, pedal steel can be used, yeah. you know, in any context. It's yeah. basically like a guitar, but it's like a million times more expressive, you know? that I think that point is what caught me, is that my experience of the pedal steel is a similar, in a similar vein. Mitch and I both, our, our first, the first way that we met was playing music on stage at churches. And um, my musician friends... Uh, mostly guitarists, um, our buddy Matt, he always had a slide. Totally, And yes. a lot of delay, a lot of reverb, and a slide, and that whiny as- atmospheric tone that you hear in a lot of your stuff Absolutely. was just normal. Yeah. And so um, my first experience with that sound was not in country music. It was in this, mm. this the way that you use it. So it makes it makes sense to me. Yeah, that is really interesting. Huh. Totally. So and outside, I like, of, outside um, of country. A lot of the a lot of the musical um where I find it outside of who the artists you mentioned, um, I like hammock and album leaf and all these and then even I think Sigaros kind of uses it too. But I think so. Yeah. That's a, my, one of my first interests in making movies was ski films. And I heard the album leaf and hammock in, in some old ski films, not old. Totally. When I, I started, I became interested in ski films in like 2011. So I, I've not seen anything old. I can't say that. (laughs) I'm nervous about that. (laughs) <laughs> hey, the P and W has a history with some really good old school ski filmmakers. So I don't want to ski filmmakers. That sounds so. I niche. don't want to. <laughs> it is bombard that one. I love uh, it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Lane, take us back to uh, well, one. I mean, you know, you could go as far back as six years ago, but maybe uh, I think you the first time we spoke, you were in education for a while as well. Totally. That, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and then walk us into your first experience with the uh, music for media, like licensing services. And Absolutely. why you're transitioning onto this next venture. Totally, yeah. So I love Spokane still. And my original reason for moving here was six years ago when I came for college um, came up for Whitworth University um, on this jazz and classical Go scholarship. Pirates. Yeah, exactly. Um, which was a very positive experience, you know. 
you know, it's, it's life, so it has ups and downs or whatever. But I would say overall it was a very meaningful, impactful experience for me. Um, going, yeah, to, so, going to Whitworth? Yeah, going to Whitworth. Um, and I chose to go there because I was like, so I played in jazz band through high school. And that was a great experience. Um, one of my friends kind of turned me on to jazz band. I didn't really know about jazz before, um, but started playing in high school and I absolutely fell in love with it um, to the point where it's like a few years later and I'm thinking, okay, college, maybe I want to go to college, maybe not. What would I want to study there? Um, and it was jazz guitar. It's like, that's what I'm into. So I saw the scholarship auditions in high school and then un universities do you know, scouting out for high schoolers. Um, so they're like, Hey, our auditions are this weekend. So come on up. Um, we want to hear you play and we'll keep in touch after that. So that was kind of my first, I guess, experience of me coming to Spokane for something. My grandma had actually lived here for, you know, my whole life before that. So I grew up coming here from time to time. Um, so yeah, came here for jazz and classical to study in school. At that point, my my, I guess, most impactful experience was um, in education, coming from the band director at my school. I was like, this guy's awesome. I want to do what he does. I think that could be for me. So that's why I chose music education. I think that's it, you know. So I was at school for music education, right? That was kind of the, I guess, the bottom line. But around that, <clears throat> there's all these experiences in the music department of at Whitworth, um, whether they're jazz, classical, uh, playing in chapel was another cool one for me. Um, all this sort of like broad musical activity that I was super into that maybe you wouldn't classify as an education practice, I guess. It's more of like a playing practice. So, um, yeah, and looking back, I think it was really, it's not necessarily education that affected me so like impactfully but I think it was music in the education. And then later when I was playing collaboratively in, in school, um, it was still the music that was impacting me. So kind of towards the end of that journey, I was there for three years because I did Running Start. Um, towards the end of that journey, I found out about, I guess, tell me if I'm wrong. I, I feel like this is, a, this is a new industry, like music for media. There's all these independent people writing music, that's maybe in a niche category. I feel like that maybe wasn't around so much 10 years ago or maybe 15 years ago. Um, I think it's, yeah. I think uh, it's pretty new, yeah. And it's, regardless of the date that it first began, it's still in its infancy, Infancy, I would say. Yeah, yeah. It's, maybe it's, it's dynamic. Maybe it's, it's, it's toddler phase. I mean, it, yeah, point. I think I would say toddler. because <laughs> Totally. As yeah. I, if I can, I'm, I'm trying to remember, I think in 2017 I signed up for a, art list subscription. Totally. Yes. Cause that was new. Yep. And, yep. um, I was nervous to start paying monthly for that, but also I it, was, I think it was only at that time, like $200 a year though. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, was pretty, right. it was pretty, pretty cheap. cheap. Yes. And it was unknown, like yeah. ha outside of that as a, just making branded content for local businesses. I don't know how I was supposed to get music Right. And when I think about music for media, like like I said earlier, I just think about the movies, like people composing, right. you know, blockbuster scores exactly. in Hollywood, like Hans Zimmer and everything. Um, but yeah, I, I basically found out, fast forward to this last year of college, there's this survey of music industry class that I took that was maybe my best experience in college. Uh, the one I'm most thankful for, I guess. Um, basically, the professor who... You know, I'd say he was my favorite professor, too, and I still go to his jazz gigs whenever I can, uh, still here in town. Um, basically, he was up there saying, these are the things that, if you're interested in working in music, these are the things that people are doing. Um, there's all sorts of things like composer's assistant, editors, um, like stuff that basically seemed accessible to me in the moment and in the place that I was in, which is Spokane. So from that moment, I was like, okay, I want to I wanna write some stuff because apparently I can actually do this thing composing without moving to L.A., you know, which I was still actually interested in moving to L.A. from, from time to time, but maybe that's a side thing. Um, the bottom line is that, oh, I can actually do this, so I want to start practicing it. Um, I think it was a year later I actually signed on with Artlist, which was an awesome experience. Um, 
I, I think I was a student teaching at the time. So there was kind of this like balance between education stuff in my life and music stuff. So I would, during the day, I would go out and teach, hang out with students, play trumpet, clarinet, flute, saxophone, you know, all that stuff. So that was, uh, that was gosh, we Stevens in here. <laughs> yeah, Jeez. which, you know, that was actually really cool. I, I loved playing all those instruments at a very basic level, like band directors do, you know. To be a good band director, I like I've seen this by example. You kind of have to learn to play all the parts on all the instruments. And as crazy at that sound as that sounds, it's pretty accessible, you know, at a middle school level to pick up a trumpet and, you know, play their part for them. I think that's maybe the best way uh, to teach. So I saw this guy do, up there doing it um, out in North Spokane, uh, where I was student teaching. Uh, so that was my daytime thing. And nighttime thing, I would just go and and uh, basically sit in this little room that I called my studio. <laughs> it was a very modest studio, to put it lightly. I didn't have very much. But I would sit with a guitar, electric guitar, acoustic. Um, I worked with like a lot of samples at that point, too, which is like a software instrument where you play a keyboard like a piano, yeah. you know, and it's hooked up to, say, a violin or yeah. brass sounds, et cetera. Um, which now I've kind of gravitated against, against using that kind of thing. But, um, that's what I was doing at the time. So I made this collection. It was called the wooden room. And so I kind of named it after this little tiny space I was working in. It's actually out in Brown's edition. Still love the space. And I drive past it sometimes and I'm like, there it is. It's up there the wooden room. Um, anyways, that's, that's how I got hooked up, got hooked up with Artlist. That was kind of the beginning of this whole industry work with music for media that I had found out, you know, like I said, that previous year in the survey of music industry yeah. class. So yeah. Artlist kind of led to other things, um, other opportunities, and I, what I would call amazing companies like Music Vine and Film Pack is another one, um, kind of basically made those connections through Artlist and some random local connections too. But basically I was now balancing all these like platforms, you know, indie platforms where people can write music filmmakers can go up there and pick up your stuff yeah it's always fun to see where it goes um and i've always i I'd said from that point on like man this would be cool if this could be the thing you know like my only job like the vocation right yeah. um so yeah now it's six years later and that's been the whole thing for the past six years and i'm excited because i actually found out about music bed back in that college class six years ago. That's why I say six years. Um, and I've thought of it kind of as this golden standard ever since, you know, in listening and in browsing the platform. I guess maybe I shouldn't say golden standard, but it like it offers something that I didn't really find elsewhere that maybe I'd describe as sort of like a human touch or it has it has feeling. You know, it's everything up there is like moving. Yeah. Um, usually like naturally sourced, like a real human being playing instruments, things like that. So yeah, but it, it took a long time and like they're pretty exclusive. So it was a dream for six years. And now finally it's like a reality, which I'm very stoked about. Um, <clears throat> one, I have questions on, you know, these different people you mentioned, you know, their names and whatnot. Totally. But uh, before... We maybe backtrack. Uh, did Music Bed uh, ask that you? Yeah, thanks, man. I'll wait for that coffee to totally the good stuff. That is Thank Sam you, peeing in a cup. <laughs> as far as you know, um, <clears throat> did Music Bed ask that you move exclusively? Was that a request of theirs, or was that a decision you made on your own? Yeah, I would say maybe it started as the the previous, the first thing you said, and maybe it's also how I would want things to, to look, you know, if I was working with Musicbed. So, and that's kind of a whole story in itself is, you know, the way this Musicbed thing got started. Um, it had been a few years in the making. This guy, uh, Chris Coleman, actually, guy on the west side now, but he lived in L.A., area i think for several years before moving to washington last year he's originally from washington and now we uh, we have some stuff together but basically this goes back to i guess a few years before now maybe the past two or three years we've had sort of a acquaintance where we 
send stuff back and forth and say, hey, I like this. What if we did this? And it kind of got to this point where we said, oh, we should we should meet up and make this EP sort of thing, right? Which finally happened this past August. And um, that's actually in the process of going live on Musicbed now. But basically, that's the connection that stemmed um, what is now the relationship to Musicbed. And yeah, I think if you go if you go out and read some contract of music beds. I don't know if I don't know if that's like something you could go out and read, but I think they do ask for exclusivity. Um, but yeah, on the other hand, to answer your question, I would I kind of would want exclusivity too. You know, um, going back to that first time discovering music bed, like oh, this seems like it seems pretty unique. Like there's nothing really else like like music bed, I guess. Um, so I kind of would want all my stuff to be on one platform just for the sake of like continuity, I think. So yeah, and I love all the platforms, but yeah, to answer your question, they do ask it and that's how I'd want it to be as well. You know, for sure. Um, the other question I had was, uh, what about these other platforms, Artlist, Film Pack, and Music Vine? Is that who else yeah, you, were, yeah. you were on? Uh-huh. Uh, what are the, you know, kind of the pros and cons you found with using their services, but, or being a, what would you, a content creator, so to speak yeah. for their services. And what are you most looking forward to that maybe the pro they had the pros of, but like a pro of music bed is they fulfill totally. The, the need for the con or the... Yes, yeah, and pros and cons, that's, that's a great question. Um, I would almost say that it's all pros with maybe just a couple cons, if anything. Like, I would say that I had a 100% positive experience with all of these platforms. And I think that the biggest thing, or I guess the coolest thing that they offer is just in the name, like their platforms, right? So it's basically a space where... Um, an independent musician has a space to produce material and give it to someone else who cares in a way that is mutually beneficial. So there's business elements, there's also personal elements, but overall I really appreciate them because of how they bring people together, I think, um, musicians and filmmakers alike. And like there's some connections that I've made, personal connections, which are really cool. There's this guy named Ferdy out in actually the Netherlands. Uh, it's, it's Hague, Netherlands, which I don't know if I'm even saying that right. I'd never heard of this place. It's a couple hours from Amsterdam, but he discovered my stuff on Artlist and he's probably reached out to me, I think once a year to do an independent project, which would never be possible if it hadn't been for Artlist, etc. Right? So the way they bring people together, I think is the most important thing to me. And that's true about all the platforms, which I'm stoked about. Yeah. Well, it's ironic that you're talking about how the platforms brought people together and, you know, like in a distant, indirect way, the platforms brought us together and we are in the same town that like we could have run, totally. into e run into each other at a coffee shop. Yeah. That's um, funny. Yeah. But I like, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Somebody in the Netherlands wanting you to write music and um, that bringing together of different art forms for mutually beneficial reasons. Um, I've not, I, I have not been able to figure out what to use my film images for. I carry around a film camera all the time and I'm taking pictures other than just printing them and putting them in my house. Yeah. I don't know how to do, I don't, I don't know how to do a, a gallery showing or I don't know what I want to do with them. Uh, I've not been able to find a purpose, but then totally. you sent song titles and a song and said, I need something that describes this. And so then I just yes. went and I, I was flooded with like, well, this makes sense. And this makes, and just images that I think tell the story of the song. Absolutely. So that was a, for me as a, as a photographer that engaged an art form that I never really knew what to do with. It was just interesting. And I have all this 
massive collection of pictures. Totally, man. And even on the flip side, I was looking at those when you first sent them and my whole, you know, train of thought was just that these images bring the tracks to life, you know, oh, good. in the way that was totally perfect. This is also so the first time we really talked about it post. It's really yeah, just been a few recent. like emails. Last but, week, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, they, they bring them to life and they give it a new character that's not anything other. It only like reinforces the character that is already in the song. So mm. I was really stoked about Good. those. So really excited to, to share them and release them. I like that. Yeah. I want to print them now. You should. Now I want to, the, <laughs> there's five, so you have five singles that are com- going to come out on Music Bed and I, yes. there's five images and I have sitting, I have this white, um, just a whiteboard with all five of the images and I want to print them and hang them somewhere. You should, man. Yeah. Well, back to what you said, Mitch, like what is, what is the pro that music bed offers? Um, that's a great question because I think it's something that I was aware of when I first saw music bed and that I'm more aware of now, six years later. And I think I would describe it pretty simply just being like, is it quality over quantity or is it quantity over quality? And both have their strengths, you know, quality and quantity. Sometimes we need a lot of something. Sometimes we need one thing that's really good, you know, or like a pair of pants. Sometimes maybe you get seven different pairs of pants for different occasions, but sometimes maybe you just want one pair that'll last 10 years, you know? Um, So the thing about Music Bed that I've noticed from the get-go is like they do seem quality over quantity. It's like I, I almost find less on there but each one each thing i find is like that's awesome you know it's moving yeah, yeah. um and which I, think, I really appreciate i think our experience of using music bed would would we would think the same thing yesterday was an example yesterday is a perfect example <laughs> something oh, <yeah>. that <laughs> typically just from from my standpoint editing so we had just a branded piece for a local business we're throwing together this video and my experience with most music platforms is scrolling for a long time to find something. Totally. Mitch is primarily our director. And so I'm editing. I'm not really thinking too deep into the story. It's for an elevator company. Nice. An elevator servicing <laughs> company. And Mitch, I said, I need a song. And you it, within seconds had something perfect. What did you do? <clears throat> nice. I just well, I just literally searched going up, and I found the oh. first track. Oh yeah, we pressed play, and literally it was like I'm gonna elevate going up. Like there's this whole yes. like I was like this is the yeah. perfect track. <laughs> one that would be a theme. One no. song, <laughs> and it was done. Yes, uh, I believe it. So perfect for elevators. Like that's amazing. <laughs> that's a theme in the elevator industry. I'm sure. Yeah. It's also a theme in music, right? Yeah. I don't that's think there's amazing. a theme in the elevator service industry, by the way, they're all, it's all what like about going down though. They don't, there's no going down. No. <laughs> oh shoot. One way. <laughs> it's just one way. Um, we're trying to create the theme. Yes. No, I, I, uh, I, yeah, I, th- I think, Back to the um, yeah, we find we find quantity over quality, quality um, over quantity, on, quality over quantity. Bed, Thank though. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, totally, totally. I got mix what you're in saying. my uh, next messages, um, <laughs> but <laughs> no, I uh, I think uh, that's that's rad. So, your would you say you said you noticed that six years ago, but it's been reinforced today. Absolutely. Um, and with that in mind, are you bringing your whole catalog over or are you s- kind of starting fresh? That's a great question. Yes. Okay. So in fact, when we were talking about um, what what was the question earlier? I can't remember, but I, I think I said like, I'd rather be exclusive than non-exclusive. Yeah. 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 Um, the reason for that is that, yeah, I, I do feel like it's a moment to start fresh with this totally new mindset. In fact, it's not so new because I've been practicing it and like desiring it this whole time, right? How can I write one thing that's like amazing rather than 10 things that are pretty good, you know? Um, But yeah, the reason that I'm not going to bring my whole catalog over um, is, is that exactly, you know, I would rather sort of have this be a fresh starting point 
where I have all of these years of experience. Not that I'm saying I have anything figured out, but I do have, I have practiced it for some time now. So I feel like I've learned a thing or two that I'm hoping to be applying here um, to get things that are quality over quantity, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I, I totally value the previous experience um, with all the other platforms and all the learning that's been happening in the studio. But um, I'm excited to take those things forward into a sort of new direction, if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, won't be bringing that whole catalog over. Um, Will you still be able to f- find, find it? Yeah, will it live somewhere? Like That's a Spotify great question. Or? Yeah. So this is also fresh, and my current focus has only been to to get, get that exclusivity live. in order. You know. So yeah, I do still have all that music, and I think it's great. Like, I want it to be somewhere. <laughs> but in order to be exclusive, it can't really be out there. So I've yet to find a way to to maybe make that, uh, make I guess, make both of those things work. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But yeah, as of right now, I'm, the music is just with me, you know, from maybe the past few years. Maybe you use a pseudonym. Yeah, to maybe it's a pseudonym, a moniker. Yeah. Yeah. I've thought Who's about that. Who's the artist you know? on Art List? That yeah, apparently has like three different names or something. Yeah, we we I, kept I, Ian Post, right? Ian Does Post. He, have like, okay. he, has, he like has like three yeah. different artist names on yeah. there that which we didn't know. We didn't know. But interesting. Someone inside told us that. We kept finding yeah. yeah, there were like three artists that we kept going back to and then we found out it's the same guy. <laughs> yeah, I I believe it. <laughs> Ian Post is amazing. I've I've been, you know, vaguely familiar for a handful of years with his stuff. Yeah, then there's the whole question of like would you want to have all these baskets for different things or would I rather have sort of one basket of quality, if that makes sense. So, yeah, you know, stuff to think about, but I I have thought about that. That's a great question. I like your uh, analogy of the pairs of pants. Yeah. Just one pair. (laughs) We we were talking about raw denim the other day, which I noticed you're wearing some black selvage today. That's good. I'm glad that you noticed. I don't know if you noticed, but (laughs) I'm wearing the same myself. That's (laughs) because we buy our pants from the same shop. That's right. So for, shout out to Nick. (laughs) <laughs> so <laughs> that's exactly what Mitch wanted to happen. Yes. Um I uh I, my mind just went to uh, a, a TV series. Um so uh oh man, gosh, I lost it for a sec. Oh yeah, if you were to give inside knowledge slash slash you know, like uh, some a piece of advice to a budding composer or musician that's looking to get onto a platform like Musicbed or Musicbed specifically. Like, what kind of things would you tell them? I, I you, you last week when we met or two weeks ago, whatever it was, uh, you gave me some insight on them operating as management for you things that i would never have oh known. yeah the, see, the whole like, representation yeah side. representation and, yeah and so like what are some things that you know people may not necessarily know that uh would be useful information yeah to, totally that's a great question i think the best advice that i've been you know given that i've heard over the years has to do with I guess the same thing, I mean, there's kind of a theme here in the musical experience from a younger age and moving into the media industry and considering Musicbed as a platform. And I think that common theme is sort of like a human touch, you know, or people, you know. Um, we, we mentioned like these platforms bring people together. Um, the most helpful advice that I've been given, it has to do with people. And it's it's like, I'm thinking back to when... A, a brother-in-law of mine who's in the film industry was telling me, you know, I was asking him the same question. What advice would you give to a budding composer like me? This is years ago, which I would still consider myself a budding composer, but still it was about six years ago at the beginning of this thing. Um, and he's like, yeah, just you got to keep doing the personal thing. Reach out personally, um, establish human connections, be a person who likes to hang out, be a presence in the room. Of course, on the other hand, it's like hone your craft, right? So you do want to be honing your craft in the studio, practicing your instruments, um, get a process that is helpful for producing music. So 
almost like journal entries. You kind of have to commit to it to, to get something out of it. So create a routine for yourself that is helpful and healthy for you to produce material. And basically the best thing is time. Ask yourself like, this is all sort of advice to myself, by the way. Ask yourself, what can I do to make this better tomorrow? Um, how can I make this sustainable for this year and next year and the one after? Um, so yeah, I guess I would sum that up by saying, hone your craft, which is a great piece of advice. And on the flip side, like be a person, be a personable person, you know, reach out personally, be a good hang. I've also heard it described that way. Um, be someone who hangs out, you know. I mean, in our, in our shop, Inland Film, if company, we focus on, on branded content because that's what pays the bills currently. Totally. But a major focus that Mitch and I have is writing and wanting to produce features that like features that we're writing. And so, and then we have episodic TV shows. And so the one thing we've focused on is just honing our craft. So every time mm-hmm. we shoot a commercial, every time we shoot somebody's uh, brand film, the, f- the focus for us is not dominating the branded content industry of Spokane, Washington. Totally. It's yeah. honing our own craft. Mitch as a director, me as a cinematographer, being a good hang, as you say, yeah. every time we get to have somebody new on set, every time we get to have a producer on set, or even, even, um, like any, like the, the AC that I get to use all the time, my camera assistant, Max knows more about the big cinema camera that we have than I do. Mm. And he's worked on a lot bigger projects than I have. And so being a good hang with my own assistant has been such a benefit. Yeah, I could see that since you're probably spending a lot of time together too. Like I've heard from touring musicians, it's almost it's almost more about the hang. We're going we, to Max know. and I are about to drive 7 hours tonight. Yeah, so to go re, to go reshoot a couple of things. Like Right. Do you want to spend 7 hours with someone who is like super uptight or always talking about themselves or yeah. something like that, you know? I did find out Max and I have spent a lot of time together on our last seven hour drive. I did find out that he's not a fan of my driving, but that's first I've heard of that. <laughs> oh, you guys got some discussing to do. Yeah, we're gonna do it late at night. Max hasn't been on this, has he? Max is on my list of people we need to have on yeah. yes. this season. So we're talking we'll we're, we're 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 talking about a future foreshadowing. Foreshadowing, yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll ask about your driving. Yeah, we'll that'll for come sure. up for sure. Yeah. Maybe Max guys... is also Max is also a car guy, so I do feel okay. intimidated when I'm driving. No, like I don't know, I don't know what's going on in his mind. And then I found out that I pushed some buttons. Oh shoot! Well, I wish you luck, my friend. <laughs> I'm I'm going to be drinking a lot more. We talked about coffee. I'm going to be drinking a lot more coffee today because yeah, I need to stay awake. Keep your chops up. Keep my chops up. Mm-hmm. Okay, you had asked me the first time. You came in here, um, who I, who we like, what we look look for in in uh, compositions. Yes, and I mentioned that uh, what I want for um, our advertising is totally different than what I want for original stories. Totally, but our our daily reel is my like experiment. I right. look at them as like little mini movie trailers, and so I get really weird with them. And I told you that there was an artist on Music Bed who does drums. That yes. I'm obsessed with all oh. the time. Yes, and yes, it's yes. it's Clayton, dude. Clayton I was wondering has who this, this is. crazy red mohawk. Wonderful. And I, um, <laughs> I used to work on um, on a marketing team at a telecommunications manufacturing company. Mitch, uh, Mitch was roommates with the marketing manager, my boss. Okay. And our team, all the graphic designers. I was the product photographer, we always had this joke. Steven was his name. He was my manager. Anytime Steven was at a loss for ideas, he was at the end of his rope and he could not figure out what we were going to do with this. He would start throwing paint splatters on the design. So if okay. he presented a bro- a product brochure with paint splatters on it, you knew he was desperate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the um, end of the rope. Anytime I, you hear Clayton's music, just straight war drums and typewriters and guns and clicks and 
Anytime you hear that going on in this office, you know I'm desperate. I cannot figure out what music. So I'm just going to go back to what I know, and that's just drum sounds. Yes. And that's when director Mitch comes in, and he's like, Okay, so let's think for a second. This so is this an, is for a children's hospital. <laughs> this is for a <laughs> children's hospital. Hear Gunshots. Not though. necessarily the right thing for this piece. Yeah, so, that's funny. When Mitch is searching on music bed, he finds good stuff. <laughs> totally. You find Clayton. <laughs> I go straight for Clayton. But man, and that, I just, sound, that sounds cool. It almost sounds more like um, Foley, you know? Yeah, it is. Like so much of it is Foley. Yeah. And um, we had a we had a piece that we did recently. Um, I had a personal video that I did recently. The the um, a buddy of mine in town with a coffee shop. I do some videos for his Instagram reels, and That's it's just right. me brewing coffee. So yes. I'm, I record it all on my phone. I edit them really fast. They're either for reels or for TikTok, and um, I pulled. I think I used a Clayton song. Okay. And he thought, I mean, the sounds, it's so, it's so much Foley. He thought that the sounds of the coffee and like my kid in the background saying things, he thought that it was all part of the song. Yes. It got all confusing. And that's what I like about it is that there's a, I think in my, um, as a, as a, um, storyteller in film, I like that the mix of of Foley and the music. I like the the. Uh, I'm obsessed with Edgar Wright. Baby Driver is one of my favorite movies. And oh, when nice. you get lost in the sounds that you're hearing and the music, and you don't know where they start and end. Yeah, I don't necessarily. I wouldn't in in the stuff that I'm writing and we're writing together. I don't think I would go that far as like. Edgar Wright's choreography where, you know, in Baby Driver, he's walking and dancing to the music. I don't wouldn't do that, but there sure. are a lot of a lot of cuts too. <clears throat> yeah. Right. It's like sounds of life, right? Mm-hmm. I'm hearing like sounds of life. Yeah. So, you know, the guy almost thought those drum sounds were like part of the part of the video, right? Yeah. It doesn't necessarily sound like what we think of as music, but right. like something that a sound that complements the the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, which is something I'm super into as well. Like I don't I wouldn't call myself a foley artist, but I do try to bring elements of life into the music, you know. Um the which kind of touch the human touch, exactly. Yeah. Like a real person did this, you can yeah. tell. That kind of thing, you know. That I think I think that is a that's something mm-hmm. that I like. That's definitely something that I picked up on your music. And you also walked in and commented. We've got I've got my drums in yeah. our office, and you commented on that. <laughs> That's right, um, dude. In uh, two thousand six, two thousand seven, two thousand eight, they had electronic drums at our church, and I Absolutely. was not. That sounds about right. <laughs> I was not okay with that. <laughs> totally. But I also was Drummer just fame. finding my obsession with like metal and drummers that destroyed yeah. drum sets and so okay. i can't i can't do that to the electronic drums right until you just start going ham on oceans and you start oh, going ham on oceans classic <laughs> absolutely classic that's <laughs> one of the best videos that exists on the internet <laughs> oh i have seen that yeah Dude, so and those were amazing. electronic drums. those were electronic sure. drums um one of the one of the things that i love about film cameras Mm -hmm. is the human touch. Like there's a tactile experience of using it. Yes. And I like expired films that do weird things and I overexpose or underexpose. And I, I like, there's a ton of film grain and it's crazy to look at. And, um, from a clinical perspective, I'm doing it wrong. Right. Technically. Right. But when I look at it, I feel something organic like the human touch yeah you have the effect right so to make something effective yeah what what goes into that it's like yeah and then when we're on when we're on (laughs) set with our we've got we've we've got this big um alexa mini lf like the one of the best sensors you can get roger deakins is talking about how perfect you can make this picture and i want to put black promist 
as much as I can in front of the lens. And I get to a point where the director and even Max, my assistant camera operator, is like, this is too far. What is Black Pro Mist? It's 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 haze. It's a hazy filter you can put on the lens to oh, okay. make it. To I mean, it's 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 right there. If it were, it's on that. Oh, nice. If, it were if you look at this, at this light, it, it is yeah it causes it to bloom. If you're watching Interesting. this, on, oh I see. On, I see. If you're watching the video of this, there's a bloom around these lights. Cool. Um, yeah. And I will take Instead it too of far. Like a harsh. Yeah. You know, well defined thing. Well, yeah, exactly. In my yeah, uh, in my hunt for that human touch yeah i'll take it too far and i have to have people around me that tell me it's too far and then we back <laughs> off and we find the right we find the right balance can mm-hmm. you go too far with the human touch you can good question you 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 can you, Sam says yes. you absolutely can. <laughs> all right <laughs> you, you can. absolutely can nice i like to go that far and then pull back because totally. i need to know where the line is <clears throat> yeah but and also experience. aesthetically it has to be on brand for you know for for us you know yeah, it was yeah. on, the, on the commercial side totally it's like does yeah. this meet this brand's standards and expectations and yeah the, the yeah. audience are they going to associate this gritty look to is the, this very high end sharp you know is the uh, company is Absolutely. the potential the match. potential customer for the um, elevator service company going to watch this video and wonder why there's smoke coming out of the elevator shaft because yeah. we needed to have it filled with haze. Could be know? a red flag. Yeah. There was no smoke. <laughs> yeah. That's probably a good thing. And it was for this one at least. It looked more like dust. If it anything. did look like dust. It okay. looks rad. So, but if, that was the question. If you like, open an elevator shaft above the elevator, <laughs> I think you would assume there's going to be like dust. So this going up thing is that a lyrical thing or instrumental? I'm it was. Uh, there are was, lyrics that yeah. uh, that the words "going up" um, showed up with. So yeah, yeah. Okay. problem we'll find ourselves in is the client wanting to uh, exclusively. By the rights to you mentioned that <laughs> that, that happened with another when you hit on a different song. when you yeah. find yeah. the perfect song and it touches the client in the right way and then they ask like, can we, we what it. does it cost to own this that's when the price goes up huh it's gonna be hundreds of thousands hundreds of dollars, of thousands sorry, of dollars. But <laughs> yeah it goes up a little bit yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> totally yeah so. Yeah, that means they buy the song and no one else can use it. It just yeah. belongs it's to usually them, right? like yeah. The one occurrence we have of that was you can you can own it for a year. You can have exclusive rights to it for a year. Okay. Or and you there could have like different prices based on exclusive rights to just use the song, meaning it would be taken off new music bed. Nobody can license it. Yeah. Or just exclusive rights for your industry. That so, makes sense. Yeah. Um, Interesting. So if anybody else applies to use this song in you know, X industry, yeah. they will not, they'll, they'll be told they can't use it, but yeah, but, really uh, you know, I don't, I think they give you a price that's so absurd. So that, that you don't do they, it. So yeah, you don't. Or do if it. you do it's do just, it, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's just a like huge profit. It has utility value. Yeah. Or it's like it's, something that, uh, you know, maybe Ford could afford. Yeah. yeah <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Something like that. But even then, but not the indie folks. Yeah. Even then these, these companies, they, they they spend all their money on talent, all, all their money on. I was reading about that on Twitter. It's like Super Bowl ads. All they all these ads now just rely on celebrities to to yeah drive the you know whatever happened to the high life guy you know yeah. high life you know because no one else can be <clears throat> Nick Offerman right yeah it's the human touch. Transition okay, so we're going to talk to the, the last, last of us. us, episode three, right? Oh, Is that where we're going now? <laughs> That's why I thought of Nick Offerman. That's right. <laughs> what kind of TV shows? Are you watching? You seem oh, to man. you seem to get really excited about The Last of Us. So yeah, so I'm stoked about The Last of Us right now because it's currently being released. And man, in Spokane, these winters are just brutal sometimes. So not that I call myself a couch potato, but like I think it's helpful to sit down and watch a couple episodes sometimes. Um, anyways, that you're being coming said, up with an excuse for why you would binge. Yeah, that's my excuse show? for binging. So I don't have an excuse for it. I, just I said do it. it. <laughs> You just do it. I love it. Um, yeah, Last of Us, it's it's awesome. I, I've been describing it as almost like The Walking Dead with the budget of Game of Thrones, oh. you know. Um, 
And is, I've been digging it. For sure. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, stoked for episodes four and five. I'm meeting up with a few buddies on Sunday to watch that. So um, anyways, been watching a bunch of Yellowstone lately, which yeah. I've been musically speaking, really digging the Western vibe yeah. you know, with this whole pedal steel baritone thing going on in the well, studio. Yeah. A little Ryan Bingham. Uh, have you gotten that far? Which one? Ryan Bingham. Oh, I don't know. Who is that? Huh? What? Is he in Yellowstone? Yeah. You so. you didn't you haven't gotten there? What see what I'm I just started <laughs> season three. I'm uh okay, I'm through four. So I we, should know Ryan Bingham. Dude, <laughs> we um dude um hold on. So you you all haven't is. met this yeah, guy? Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, that's Ryan Bingham. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Why I, I didn't Walker. know that. Yeah, Walker. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. His name's Walker. Every, He's a guitar guy. I know. Yeah. Yeah. That's Ryan Bingham. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, this what is, else is new information in? to me. Huh? I just thought, I just thought, oh man, this guy's playing guitar again. No, he's not in he's anything. Out there singing he's a sad a, song. He's a musician first. Yeah. Oh, and wow. like so, I he, was thinking like he has great musical quality. You and should. That's he, that's he's you a should. <laughs> you should go listen to some Ryan Bingham after this. Yeah. I'll check yeah. That out Spencer and I sure. saw him uh, live actually in Spokane at the Fox uh, a few years ago. Nice. Um, I knew that. Yeah. Okay, I get it now. Yeah, he did not. I mean, this he was very. This, the show's been out for forever, but he did not go to the train station. I, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He survived. Spoiler alert! My goodness, oh, shoot. I said it's been out for a few <laughs> years. Sweep it out. Yeah. Anyways, the music though, right? Yeah. It's uh, it's pedal steel friendly. It's like I'm hearing all these moody strings mixed with guitars and yeah. pedal steel. I don't I, like. I've heard pedal steel on the show, but it's been in recorded songs like Willie Nelson, right? I don't think they have pedal steel in the score. But that being said, very inspiring. It's very, but it's a lot of strings. Yeah, a lot of strings. Um, yeah, so I've just been really driven towards this Western thing lately. So hopefully more on that to come mm. on Music Bed. We recently got into Yellowstone. We've avoided it for a long time. Everybody around us watches it. Um, my Both my parents... And my wife's parents have been obsessed with it yeah. since the beginning. <laughs> and totally. um, my father-in-law does ranch He's in a Montana, rancher. and That's so right. he, he, I think my and my wife rides. She's a she's she's pretty proficient. Yeah, um, on a horse, and so I think out of distaste for the way that Hollywood portrays Montana, yeah, she has avoided it. Yeah. And, um, I don't know what it was. Yeah, I think I just kind of felt that same way. We've been watching it, is it now. Cheesy. I mean, I'm, I would say yeah, I'm very much thing. into it now. Okay, nice. And this right Ryan here, Booth, that right yeah. there, this guy right here. Yeah, Ryan Booth. That's, that's Ryan Booth. Uh, that's yeah, him. He, he took oh, yeah, yeah, he yeah. took Ryan Bingham and made, so I made the, a ranch water. Uh, it makes sense to me now. So I know and that exactly was after where. Yellowstone. I know exactly, oh, okay. and it makes sense now. It's it, it's like all of the worlds collided. Yep. Interesting. So well, I'm about to go check him out. I like to make this. fun of the fact that everybody on the show has their collar popped. Exactly. If they're, if they're serious, yep, their collars popped. Visual cues. Yeah, there's visual cues. Absolutely. Jamie most of the time doesn't have his collar popped. Right. And he's more a tame. Yeah. Well, not necessarily tame. He's <laughs> being looked down upon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then like I'll notice like there are certain episodes where Rip doesn't have his collar popped. He's okay. wearing a vest and there's no collar. And I'm I like look I see that costume design is telling a very subtle story with the collars. It totally is. So every yeah. time I leave the house, I make sure to c pop the collar just to frustrate my wife. Yeah, about to be serious she sees business it. if that yeah. collar Don't is talk to me. Don't I'm talk on my to way me. Out. Watch your step, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, no, it, it is very Hollywood, you know, ish. Um, but I like it, you know, the production elements. So it's it is it's probably definitely, not like Montana. But it's more I I like it more. Now that I've gotten into the story, I like it more than I thought I was going it, to. Yeah, it took me a while. I mean, Sydney was hooked right away, and I was like, okay, you like a show? I'm going to watch it. Because absolutely, my wife does not watch 
shows. That's true. The, you got to get, you got to so, hop on one yeah, if she's going to like yeah. it. You got to hop on the bandwagon yeah. if you're going to enjoy something. So totally. I noticed <laughs> the end of episode or the end of uh, season three or the, the, the end of season two, I picked up on, I feel like they want it to be Montana's uh, Sons of Anarchy. Oh, and that I'm unfamiliar. Kate, they want Casey uh, to Sons be Sons of Anarchy. Yeah, Sons of Anarchy. Oh. They want Casey to be their Jax Teller. And okay, I get it. The noble heart, but he is not Jax. And so yeah. now, after this, after the end of episode two, I've just been watching this the whole time, thinking you're not Jax. You're not. <laughs> J- I can't get that out of my mind. You gotta, you gotta go tell him. No, hey, I'm just you're not Jax. He probably hears that. Yeah, I'm not does. the only one to pick up on that. So <laughs> the next question would uh, be, uh, especially just coming from you and the music side, would be who in film would you consider, if you know, multiple names if you want, but favorite composer? Yeah, that's a great question I've thought about for a while now. Let's see. Like, to me, there's different types of composers almost based on my listening experience, are they doing like really big movies or sort of more indie stuff? So maybe I'll pick one of each of those. Um, As far as like bigger productions, I have always loved, um, why am I forgetting the name? He's on Harry Potter. He's on uh, Way of Water, I think is what it's called. His name is Alexander Desplat or Desplat. He's a French guy. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but he like... Like, I would characterize his music as, like, blue. It's, like, deep, moody, and, like, detailed. You say you say blue, and you also said he's the way of, of water. Maybe that's why, that's yeah. I mean, so I think that's a movie, right? Or the Sarah way of water. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and he does, like, Harry Potter. He does a whole bunch of stuff. He does this movie about dogs that I haven't seen, but I've heard the score a whole bunch of times. Um there's also, what is it? The Danish Girl, I think is what it's called. That's a beautiful score that I haven't actually seen the the movie. But I love going back to to his work just because it's, it's big orchestra. It's very well orchestrated, well written, um, very classical sounding. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's awesome. I would recommend his stuff to anybody. Um, you awesome. changed. You changed my life recently when you... <laughs> Um, you oh. asked me what I like, what what kind of com- compositions I like for film, and I had I mentioned some answer, by the way. <laughs> some movies that I like that I've been I've been listening to the scores just kind of for inspiration lately, mm-hmm. and I don't I, th- all these names I don't understand I don't recognize Hilder yes Hilder. I don't even know how to say her last name but yes I had uh, said I mentioned the Joker and Chernobyl yeah and then uh, now I you you said oh that's the same person it is and then I've been listening to her compositions just. At random, going through any of them. Very dark, organic. Yeah. I might, I might call her like on the indie side too. Yeah. I don't know her too well, but she seems pretty indie. And then this guy. Big production. Yeah. Yeah, Johan Johansson. Yeah. He passed I'm away. Vaguely familiar. Did he oh, really? Did he? Yeah. He did. Pretty, s- I'm fairly certain he passed away. He's He did uh, Sicario Arri- Arrival. and Arrival. Oh, yeah. Sicario. And I've that. got him just at random shuffle on. Re- um, and Pris. Oh, he did Prisoner too. Mm hmm. Man, we also listened to uh, 1917 the other day, which yep. which is my next answer. Thomas Newman has always been a really big favorite of mine. He um, he he died yesterday, five years ago. Five years. Johan ago. Johansson. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. February 9th, two thousand eighteen. Huh. <coughs> okay. Yeah, not too familiar. Thomas Newman. Thomas Newman did he, uh, 1917, and then 1970 he did Finding Nemo. Nemo back in the day when when I was a child. So I've been hearing his stuff for a long time. I think the most, I actually think the most impactful film moment for me in the past few years was his cue. It's called Come Back to Us. It's on 1917. It's at the end where the soldier's all done, and he sits down next to the tree. He's looking at the photograph. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that's got to be the most beautiful cello I think I've ever heard recorded. Yeah. So I just remember being absolutely impacted by that. Um, and it's Thomas Newman. So how could you not be? So we Dude, were, he we has were got in- the bl- longest list of major feature films. Yeah. Yeah. I watched this, this interview of him. He, he definitely comes from a strong background family wise of like musicians. I think his dad was a major composer. He, when he was a, a young, kid 
or maybe teenager, young adult, he helped on some John Williams scores too, mm. like Star Wars, which is a big one. So he's been in the industry for a long time. I just watched, so Thomas Newman did The Little Things. I just watched this film the other night on HBO. It's Rami Malek and um, Denzel Washington and Jared mm. Leto. And I, uh, my interpretation of this movie is Rami Malek and Jared Leto were just watching Denzel Washington <laughs> do his thing. The main character. That's all this was. And then, uh, and, and and Rami Malek and and Jared Leto were just sort of goofing off while Denzel killed it. <laughs> yeah, man. On the other hand, though, if I'm looking for something to keep the tones a little lower. Um, on the indie side, I've always loved this this one guy, Dustin O'Halloran. He's a piano player. Um, and I actually found out about him, I think, in the same way that I found out about Hildur, uh, who's on Chernobyl and Joker, right? Yeah. Spitfire Audio does these composer highlights, and I think he was highlighted one time. But if you all have ever seen Lion is a movie, yeah, yeah. Um, he's I think that's his most popular score of Dustin O'Halloran. Man. He's mostly is that a, the one a piano with player. Dead Patel? That Lion, what Dev Patel, is that? Oh, I think that's right. Yeah. The actor? Yeah. I think that's right, yeah. Yeah, I he did Lion, he does He does some other stuff. He's also a composer in, in his own right. Like, he has a book of opuses and sonatas, right? So you can buy it and keep it on your piano and open one up. It's pretty accessible piano music. Huh. Um, so, yeah, that's that's great, just, like, if you're chilling at home. Um, it's it's a, It's dark and moody very solo based it's not a big orchestra right yeah and then here's another one that i've been really digging lately almost in the same vein as dustin o'halloran but i would say maybe even more indie this guy i think he's from i'm gonna get this wrong but i want to say sweden uh his name is benjamin gustafsson and i've been i've been having his stuff on the speaker yeah, you every day him. lately He's like this indie guy. I think he plays piano primarily, but he has a lot of other stuff in there. He plays guitar. He sings. Um, that, to me, is music with feeling. And uh, I love to... Yeah, it just makes any any day better. Listen to some Benjamin Gustafsson. That's kind of he's, more on the he's solo side, too. dark blue. A lot of yeah, deep yeah. blues. Speaking of blue, dark and moody, you know, he's definitely in that same vein. Yeah, so I've been checking out his stuff. I think he actually maybe started on Musicbed too, but now he's more thought of as a as a Spotify artist. Um, and I know this guy, this guy Chris that I mentioned earlier, Chris Coleman yeah. on the West Side has done collabs with this person. Um, so I think they're acquainted, you know, mm. which is cool. It's awesome. That's yeah. a whole world that I don't I don't think about. Because we'll sit here and we'll bounce back and forth with directors and cinematographers and producers, and then I, and then the world of composers goes even deeper. I think. Yeah, it's a community. I mean, it's an en enormous like music is an enormous world. Yeah. Like people say it's a small world, you know, in music, but. I feel more often times that like the musical world is so vast that you could spend a whole many lifetimes doing nothing but that and never reach the end of it. Yeah. So you got film, you got the whole soul vibe, got Alan yeah. Stone in town, you got the bar bands, you mentioned some country band in Spokane. Yeah. I mean Colby Acuff. Yeah. Totally. So. Yeah, it's it's enormous. So and that's because everyone <clears throat> just does their thing, which they should keep doing, you know. Yeah. Sweet. Well, I feel like uh, that was a good good for a, a first conversation on the pod with you. Yeah, I really yeah. enjoyed that. I appreciate you uh, making it out here and another another uh, artist here in the Spokane region. Totally. So, yeah. Pretty... Excited to be seeing how this music bed thing goes in, in the Northwest, which yeah. is something I haven't previously discovered. So. Hopefully we can represent it really well, you know. That's the hope. I think I think that what I'm finding is that the the Northwest is already represented pretty well and I just didn't realize it. Oh yeah. Yeah. In, in the film I mean world, even like world? Well, I mean even in just in in music 
Washington State especially has a long history of oh yeah Seattle massive everything. names totally. Mm-hmm. But I I do think one of the, we talk about dark deep blue sad almost like um, I think Noah Gunderson is a good example oh, yeah. of like what the Northwest stands for musically. <laughs> yeah, he's a favorite of mine too. Absolutely, long time favorite. Just listened to him yesterday, actually. In fact, my Spotify number one last year. Uh, go check it out. Sleepless in Seattle, right? So that's cool because it's Seattle. It's Noah Gunderson. It also features my favorite pedal steel guitarist, uh, Greg Lease. Mm. So it's kind of this this collision that's of good. multiple worlds. You and know? and uh, another track on that album was uh, Atlantis. That's right, uh, with, Phoebe, with Bridgers. Phoebe Bridgers. Just listen to that too. Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, did you see her live this year? I did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I went to the show. I was mostly excited to see somebody of that caliber performing at the Spokane Pavilion. Yeah, which is like a very aesthetic venue. It's you know? such a cool venue. Yeah, it's amazing. Like, here's the dream concert for Spokane Pavilion is Bon Iver. Oh yeah. Right. So they just announced they're going to be at day in day out this summer. I'm trying to snag some tickets. Hopefully today. I'm just waiting for those day passes to become available, but. Man, I hope someone gets them Bon Iver out to the Spokane Pavilion because that would be the dream show. Yeah. I don't know if they would play something so small, but like Phoebe Bridgers played oh, it. Oh, dude. So. Uh, he, <laughs> I, I missed it, um, unfortunately. I was invited, but it was a long story. I'll tell you, share after the uh I feel like I'm about uh, to be really jealous. Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> he, he performed at a cemetery show in LA when I was down there in like 2009. Wow. Yeah. Just Justin Vernon then? Uh, no, it was the whole band. It was the band. Wow. So, yeah. Amazing. So it was Boney Bear at a cemetery. Yeah. And it was a very like word of mouth. If you found out about it, you could show up kind of thing. Man, that is cool. So, um, I feel like that's their thing, you know. Yeah. So I just on the DL. I don't know if they uh, or him would care about what size of venue. I think like yeah. my brother just yeah. saw him at Kettle. on a personal level, probably not. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, saw my brother saw him at Kettle House. A yes, couple years I was ago. at that one too. Yeah, yeah. That's a special one because he mentions in the podcast uh, the Indigo Girls was an opening band. That's like his long time. One of his favorite you know, duos, I guess they're a duo. Um, they performed the song fugitive and we actually looked backstage and we saw Justin Vernon just like having this moment, like sitting down, standing up, like it was very cool. That was probably my favorite show ever. In fact. Yeah. <laughs> well, this was serendipitous for us because I think music drives a lot of Mitch and I's inspiration in writing we, we may not have full scripts for stuff written, but we do have huge playlists for the TV show that we want to make, you know? Yeah, that's um, really cool. And we both met playing music. And so I think this is, this is something that we always enjoy focusing on. I think we subconsciously focus on. So I'm glad that we, had to, we got to have you on here. You pointed out we've had Absolutely. three. This is the third composer we've had on. It is nice. Well, and then you know, you Alex Knickerbocker, Knickerbocker. came came from a background. Yeah. Oh, where yeah. he was. I think I did at do a, that one too. He was at a, a, crossroads. a crossroads of do I go down the com, com, yeah. composition composer side of things or do I? And he he came across he the world of Foley. sound and Foley and film. Totally. So, yeah. Which so, is super cool. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, man, I feel lucky to be the third one. So <laughs> thanks for having me. <laughs> well, cheers. Appreciate it. Thanks, Lane. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Cinetherapy Podcast, created by If Company, formerly Inland Film Co. Check us out on all the social platforms. That's a wrap.